Tonight on Quest, discover the Earth's critical zone, where rock meets life, and learn why climate researchers are so interested in revealing the secret life of a raindrop. And what do particle accelerators, also known as atom smashers, actually do? Quest explores the important role that Bay Area scientists had in designing the machines that reveal the most essential mysteries of the universe. And get a crab's eye view of life in a Pacific tide pool. Support for Quest is provided by the National Science Foundation, the S.D. Bechtel Jr. Foundation, Hope Lab, the David B. Gold Foundation, the Dirk and Charlene Cabsonell Foundation, the Vadez Family Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, and the Smart Family Foundation. Support is also provided by the members of KQED. Quest is a project of KQED Science. Where do raindrops come from? It's a simple enough question, right? But simple questions don't always yield straightforward answers. In this case, the answer is surprisingly complex, but it may also be incredibly valuable because scientists now believe that unlocking the life story of a raindrop may actually be the key to predicting the future of the Earth's fresh water supply. Got it again. Let's hope this one falls free. That was a nice shot. It went right over the branch you wanted it to. In 2006, researchers from the University of California at Berkeley embarked on a multi-year study sponsored by the Keck Foundation called the HydroWatch Project. It was designed to precisely monitor and measure the pathways of water in Mendocino County's Angelo Coast Range Reserve as it cycles from the groundwater table to the tops of trees and into the atmosphere. Okay. That's great because it's right in the middle of the watershed. That'll be a great vertical gradient for microclimate. We were really interested in learning the fate of precipitation in the land surface. So really trying to figure out when precipitation arrives at the site. Where does it get into the rock? Where does it get into the stream? How does it recharge the groundwater? How much of it is used by the vegetation? And ultimately, how much of it ends up in the streams and going back out to the Pacific Ocean? Through the HydroWatch study, scientists learned that a lot more water is actually stored underground in the fractured bedrock beneath the Earth's surface than they'd previously thought. Now they're working to understand how that water is used in the hydrologic cycle. One of the most important discoveries that I think we've made uh, through the HydroWatch project is the role that rock moisture is playing in regulating what gets into the stream and actually what's available to the vegetation that's growing over the top of that fractured rock surface. In 2013, HydroWatch expanded in scope to become part of a landmark study sponsored by the National Science Foundation called the Critical Zone Observatories Program. Today, there's a national network of 10 CZO watershed sites across the United States each with unique climate, geology, and vegetation. The critical zone is a pretty new term, and it really tries to capture this idea of the zone between fresh bedrock beneath our feet and the top of the vegetation, where the trees are interacting with the atmosphere. So it's everything in between. It's rock, it's soil, it's the vegetation, and it's the atmosphere that's coupled to that vegetation. That's the critical zone. It's where life meets rock. The practical reason for why we need to be studying the critical zone is as climate is changing, as lands are changing because of human occupation and human use of that land surface, we're disturbing the way the earth works. And if we don't really put a singular focus on really understanding the importance of that critical zone, as we march into the future and climate continues to change, we're not going to really understand how to mitigate for those kinds of impacts that humans and climate are actually having on resource balance on planet Earth. 
Scientists across a broad range of Earth life and computer sciences, from microbiologists to electrical engineers, are working together to conduct research and share data within the most comprehensive hydrologic science network in the world. We have to be interdisciplinary. We really need to be talking to the atmospheric scientists, the soil scientists, the stream ecologists, the biologists, and really try to understand the interconnections between all of those pieces that are living and are part of the skin on our planet to really understand what regulates the movement of resources through that critical zone. These expansive efforts emerged from a remarkably fundamental query. I asked what I thought was a very simple question. How old is the water in the stream? Is it from yesterday's rain? Is it from last year's rain or this season's rain? Or is it 100,000 years old? Every school child learns the basics of the water cycle. Ocean water, heated by the sun, evaporates and forms clouds, which are made up of millions of tiny water droplets. Land formations and changing air temperatures force clouds to rise and cool. This triggers the release of precipitation. The water enters soil, streams, and underground aquifers. Some flows back into the ocean. Some evaporates back into the atmosphere from plants in a process called transpiration. Inez Fung led the original HydroWatch project and has continued to work with what is now called the Eel River Critical Zone Observatory. As an atmospheric scientist and the co-director of UC Berkeley's Institute of the Environment, she's been on the forefront of global climate change research for more than 30 years. I like solving puzzles, and the Earth is just a gigantic puzzle about how things work, why it rains, why there are warm days and cold days, where the water comes from, where the water goes, where the air comes from, and it is a marvelous puzzle. To help solve that puzzle, researchers at the 10 CZO sites scale trees and towers hundreds of feet tall and drill deep into bedrock to place sensors that gather climate information from various parts of the critical zone. Their instruments transmit real-time measurements of air temperature, rock moisture, soil water content, and stream flow. We call this the critical zone tree because it's the most heavily instrumented tree in the Sierra Nevada. We have about 150 or 200 sensors. There's a sensor for humidity, temperature. Those are sap flux measurements to measure how much water is moving up the tree trunk and going out through the leaves to the atmosphere. I'm parallel with the data logger. Yeah. That's the north Todd side. Dawson is a plant physiologist. His part in the project is to provide information on the role that the plants and trees are playing in how water moves through the Eel River watershed. 75 to 80 percent of the water on this planet is recycled through agriculture, through forests, through the plants. You take those plants away, you remove that straw in the earth, that conduit for water to move out of the soil and back into the atmosphere, and that eventually can lead to deserts expanding. It changes the climate. We know that, for example, when trees were cut down in the Amazon, there was less precipitation. Back in his lab at UC Berkeley, Dawson pours over the watershed data like a detective looking for clues. The neat thing about water, as it undergoes evaporation, condensation, or even sublimation into things like snow or ice, it changes its isotope value. And we can actually ask, ah, was that a cold storm? Was that a warm storm? Was that snow? Was that fog? They all basically have a unique stable isotope fingerprint. And that's great, because then we can use it as a tracer and really watch how water is moving through the watershed. For example, a high concentration of carbon, nitrogen, or iron indicates the water came from surface soil. Isotope ratios can also tell if water has evaporated from a plant or spent years in rocks. Knowing where the water comes from and how fast it's moving through the watershed enables Fung to create computer simulations of different weather scenarios. From these, she's able to predict how climate change might affect our fresh water supplies. We are predicting where it is warm or hot, it's going to be hotter and drier. And so that means less water available to the plants. And if the plants 
are not there, then we have less transpiration, less communication of water from the soil to the atmosphere, and we're in for a drought. And that's what we're predicting, uh, which is rather grim. Now there's more precipitation that's actually falling over the oceans. And the reason why that's occurring is that as humans have changed that Earth's surface, it heats up more, it pushes the moisture away from the Earth's surface, pushes it out to the ocean. When there's more water falling over the ocean, there's less water falling over the land. And we need that water on the land surface to grow our crops, to sustain our natural ecosystems. And when you combine less available fresh water with a rapidly growing human population, you've got a recipe for disaster. At the crux of the problem is one simple fact. The Earth won't ever make any new water, but hopefully keeping better track of the water we do have will help us adjust to the drier times ahead. I have to be hopeful. I think there's been tremendous awareness uh, around the world about the crisis that we're in, and I think that together we can do something about it. Scientists from around the world spent 10 years building the biggest atom smasher ever created. They built this gigantic new machine in Switzerland to find answers to the most fundamental questions about the universe. You want to know what are the basic building blocks out of which the entire universe is made and what glues those building blocks together? What are the forces that hold them together? At the start of the 20th century, physicists realized that microscopes wouldn't be enough to observe what makes up the atom. So instead, they created devices that use electromagnetic fields to propel subatomic particles to high enough energies to reveal what's inside them or to create new particles. Though known in popular culture as atom smashers, particle accelerators actually smash particles that are inside the atom, like protons or electrons. Today, the most famous one is the Large Hadron Collider, so big that its 17-mile underground tunnel straddles the border between Switzerland and France. 
Activated in 2008, it cost billions of dollars and involves 13,000 scientists and students from 50 countries. They're trying to further our understanding of some of the most basic questions of physics. What's the atom made of? It's made of a nucleus and electron. What's the nucleus made of? It's made of a proton and a neutron. What are the proton and neutrons made of? They're made of quarks. What's the quark made of? We don't know. Since the 1930s, physicists in Northern California have played key roles in finding answers to these questions and in building particle accelerators that paved the way for the Large Hadron Collider. It's a Bay Area phenomenon in some ways. I really think that a lot of these basic concepts of accelerators started here in the Bay Area, you know, both at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, where I am, and over at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. The Bay Area's history of particle accelerator research began on the UC Berkeley campus in 1930, when 29-year-old physicist Ernest Lawrence designed a circular particle accelerator. His cyclotron was a breakthrough because without requiring much energy, it could produce very energetic particles in a small space. Up until that point, the energies were so low that it was hard to excite uh, nuclei and really see what they're made of. What do they do when they spin up? What do they do when they heat up? Lawrence's first cyclotron fit in the palm of his hand. The machine's second iteration fit on a table. To get the charged particles moving fast, Lawrence bent them into a circular path using two magnets like this one. Then he gave the particles regular pushes to increase their velocity. Timing when you give it that kick or that nudge is, that's of essence, that's the important part of a, about a cyclotron. If you're taking a child to the park, as you give them that nudge on the swing, if you mistime that, you can either slow the child down or you can just do nothing because you miss being able to impart and increase their velocity at all. The cyclotron reached an energy level that allowed Lawrence and his colleagues to easily investigate the nucleus of an atom for the first time. To do this, they bombarded charged particles against different elements. By adding protons to the target nucleus, they created new elements. During World War II, Lawrence turned the cyclotron into a device that could separate out the type of uranium necessary to produce the atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. It is a legacy of nuclear physics that our forefathers were instrumental in making nuclear weapons possible. And now we, we live with that for good or for bad. Besides helping usher in the atomic age, they inaugurated the field of nuclear medicine. In fact, most cancer patients who undergo radiation therapy today do so in an accelerator. For his invention of the cyclotron, Lawrence received the 1939 Nobel Prize in Physics. Today, the laboratory Ernest Lawrence started on the UC Berkeley campus is the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Its cyclotron is one of two facilities in California used to test the computer chips that go into satellites. The cyclotron emulates the high radiation that satellite electronics encounter in space. To do so, they bombard the chips with charged atoms called ions. Today we have copper, yttrium, silver, terbium, neon, argon, tantalum, xenon, and krypton. Control room. Yes, can I have xenon, please? Xenon, coming up. When the computer chip fails, the tester has found its maximum radiation tolerance. In their effort to discover smaller and smaller levels of matter, physicists built ever more fanciful accelerators. In 1962, in Menlo Park, construction began on the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. At two miles, its accelerator was the longest in the world. Linear accelerators, also referred to as LINAX, push particles in a straight line as opposed to a circle. When it turned on in 1966, the new LINAX mission was to find out what was inside the protons and neutrons that make up the atom's nucleus. One of the very early experiments was to take the beam from the linear accelerator, which was the highest energy electron beam in the world, and shoot it into a 
target that was made of protons and neutrons. And if the proton, say, was a nice uniform bag of jelly, then you would see the, the trajectory of the electron deflected, but not by much. On the other hand, if the proton was like jam, if it had seeds of jam, then every once in a while that point-like electron would hit a seed in the proton, and it would come out scattered at a big angle. The physicists found that there were indeed seeds in the jam. The protons and neutrons were made of something smaller, which scientists named quarks. Not only were they smaller, but they were even weirder than that, because instead of having one unit of charge like the electron has and the proton has, they had fractional units of charge, charges of one-third, two-thirds. What are those things doing there? Immediately the question became, how many quarks are there? This new question would require a new type of accelerator. Physicist Burton Richter pioneered the idea of a collider and in 1972 built one attached to the Stanford LINAC. Instead of smashing particles against a stationary target, as the LINAC did, the so-called Spear Collider smashed beams of accelerated particles against each other. What happens when you go bowling and you roll a bowling ball down? Only a small part of the energy gets transferred to all the pins. Now, if you think of rolling two bowling balls at each other, you're going to turn all the energy into interaction energy. This energy was then available to create new subatomic particles. As Albert Einstein outlined in his famous equation, mass can transform into energy, and energy can transform into mass. If you smash particles against each other, the resulting energy will transform into mass, that is, particles. The Spear Collider was so good at this that it helped shed light on the question of the number of quarks. Many physicists in the early 70s believed that only three types of quarks existed. The up and down quarks made up ordinary matter, the stuff that we and our planet are made of. One more, dubbed the strange quark, was produced in accelerators. In 1974, two years after turning on the Spear Collider, Richter's team found a heavy particle made up of a fourth type of quark. There is no question that Spear hit the jackpot. His discovery of this so-called charm quark won Richter the 1976 Nobel Prize in Physics and paved the way for a theory to explain how matter is organized. A series of experiments between uh, Burt's discovery in 74 and the early 80s established what we now call the standard model of particle physics. It's our understanding of how the world works at its most basic and fundamental level, and this is work that's gonna stand for hundreds of years. The charm quark and other fundamental particles like it are rare today. We have to make them in accelerators or look for them in space. But 14 billion years ago, at the time of the Big Bang, they were everywhere. Their interactions determined how the universe evolved in the first moments after its birth. Where do we see them now? We see them now in supernova explosions. We see them now in cosmic rays, which bombard us all the time. It took physicists decades to drill deep down into the atom and discover its smallest parts. But it turns out that all this ordinary matter makes up less than 5% of the universe. And invisible matter that scientists refer to as dark matter is much more plentiful. And this we know by looking at galaxies, things like rotating galaxies, you have to have enough mass in them to keep them from falling apart. We can measure the visible mass and it wouldn't hold these spiral galaxies together. They would just fly apart. But the question is, what is the dark matter? We think that it's made out of a kind of very massive particle that's very hard to produce. Which brings us back to the Large Hadron Collider near Geneva, Switzerland. It takes the concept behind the Spear Collider and smashes particles together. Only the collisions produce an energy level about 1,000 times higher, which the international team hopes will be enough to create dark matter. The Large Hadron Collider has already helped scientists discover a new particle called the Higgs boson. 
It's also known as the God particle because it has a godlike ability. As other particles travel through the Higgs field, they acquire mass, the very mass that makes them particles. The Bay Area's accelerators are not, for the most part, being used anymore to study the building blocks of matter. They now serve as powerful microscopes to examine things like proteins. But the original goal of their creators is very much alive today. My feeling is that if Ernest Lawrence were alive today, what Ernest Lawrence would be doing is traveling off to uh, Geneva to the Large Hadron Collider. And uh, I'm sure he would have found that so exciting just to be there and take part in that experiment. Support for Quest is provided by the National Science Foundation, the S.D. Bechtel Jr. Foundation, Hope Lab, the David B. Gold Foundation, the Dirk and Charlene Cabsonell Foundation, the Vadez Family Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, and the Smart Family Foundation. Support is also provided by the members of KQED. Quest is a project of KQED Science. A KQED television production.